Thank you. Well, thank you everyone for joining us for the first grand rounds of the academic year. We have a very interesting presentation ahead of us. Uh, prior to introducing today's speaker, I just wanted to take some time to welcome our critical care applicants. They're joining us remotely today. Uh, today's speaker is one of our own, Dr. Andreas Mora. Uh, he's currently our chief uh, pulmonary critical care fellow and throughout fellowship, Andreas has been extremely successful giving multiple presentations, sitting on multiple committees and um, publishing multiple manuscripts. Uh, for those who have not had the opportunity to work with Andreas, it's always a pleasure, certainly a treat to be on service with him. Uh, he's a very thoughtful, hardworking, um, and just an extremely well-rounded clinician. Uh, I'm really excited uh, for his talk because it's a, a topic that's dear to my heart. I think it's really important for any critical care physician uh, to know about and, and something that can improve survival for our cardiac arrest population. Today, we'll be speaking about eCPR. I'll hand it over to Andreas. Right, thank you, Gil, for that um, undeserved and overly good uh, introduction. <laughs> so here's the, the CME uh, disclosure for anybody that, that needs it. Um, and whoop. All right, perfect. And we will start. So again, thanks again for introducing me. My name is Andres. I'm one of the third year fellows. Um, and, and being a third year fellow, it means that I'm an expert on nothing. And as an expert on nothing, this presented an amazing opportunity to decide what topic I wanted to, to discuss here on, on, on this uh, lecture today. And initially, you know, the first thing that comes to mind always is talk about your research. And um, while I was thinking I may be preparing to, to do a lecture about my research, I was also notified that we had uh, critical care um, interviewees today. I was thinking that I don't know how exciting would it be for people to hear about uh, me creating um, technologies to improve education in resource limited settings. So from there, I thought about doing something in IP, since it's another kind of a passion of mine, but um, just literally did one uh, talk in IP last week, and we had a grand round of, of that uh, recently. So ended up thinking, hmm, why don't I learn about a topic that I don't know enough and uh, expand my own knowledge and hopefully help expand uh, everybody else's. So we're going to talk today about um, our journey to developing an eCPR program here at Yale. And on the way, we learn, we'll learn about eCPR, what it is, and who can benefit from it. Um, just a little caveat before we start, at 4 p.m., uh, I'm going to be very careful to finish on time since at 4 p.m. for the fellows, we have an invited lecturer from Penn come and talk to us about lung transplant. For anybody that wants to stay there, feel free to stay uh, for that talk, but I want to be uh, mindful and respectful of his time. Um, also want to just do a little bit plug in here uh, for the fellows and also for any, anybody on faculty that, that wants to attend. Tomorrow, we have our first of our career networking series um, where we're bringing some ex-Yale graduates to come and talk to us and, and interact with us for networking. Both Dr. James Toller and Virginia Brady, we're expecting them to be here. So um, you're all invited. All right. So I don't know who here is a, a fan of podcasts, but I'm a huge fan of them. I, fi I find them an amazing opportunity to learn while doing absolutely any everything else. And recently, I was listening to the podcast of the um, Blue Journal. And they had this um, session on storytelling and how uh, telling compelling stories is a great way to gain engagement. So I was initially going to tell you the history of ECMO CPR, um, but I'm actually just going to tell you a little bit of a story. So first mention of eCPR was done in 1966 by Dr. Kennedy at Cleveland Metropolitan Hospital, now called uh, Metro Health in Cleveland. And here are his findings or, or what he reported. So he said, Heart lung machines now used for cardiac surgery should be considered for use as an extended form of cardiopulmonary resuscitation. We're talking about 1966 again. Um, in selected patients of eight patients, which is his uh, cohort, from whom cardiac arrest had proven refractory to open and close heart surgery, uh, close heart massage, sorry, a little bit different than how we do it now, all but one were resuscitated and survived hours to days. Not the best outcomes hours to days, but it's pretty impressive if you think about this, that they were able to achieve return of spontaneous circulation in eight in seven of their eight patients um, in, 60, in 1966. These were patients that were in the OR um, and had arrests in the OR. Here's a little bit of a table of the distribution of these patients, and you can see how the majority of them died a couple of hours later, a couple of hours after receiving CPR. But again, the, the fact that they were able to be... Um, turn back was pretty impressive. This is the machine that they were using at the time. This is a bubble dispersion oxygenator. So this huge thing, they had to move, they had it in the OR already ready for this, wrapped in quote unquote sterile cellophane, which I find also very interesting. That was their, their, their way to keep uh, things sterile, to be able to be handled and moved in uh, to the patients. So not exactly the best outcomes, but definitely something very interesting. Now from 66 to basically mid 2000s, 
the interest for ECMO CPR decayed and only um, around 13 publications were uh, placed in the literature. But over the last five years, actually, the excitement for this is just rush. And more than 600 publications have been uh, presented to this time. And you can see in the last couple of years, actually, has been an incredible amount of interest in this. Um, and especially the last two years and, and this year, you can see how by half of the year, we've done almost already more than half of what was on that year. So we can just expect more and more studies to come out. So definitely very exciting and very um, interesting. So I'm gonna show a couple of pictures that I'm sure many, many of you um, know. And you know the interest, this in the early 2000s, mid 2000s, came mostly from Europe. And I have some pictures that, again, many I know many of you have seen, but this is a patient receiving, being cannulated at the Louvre in Paris. But what surprised me about this picture was not the fact that this happened, it's the fact that this was back in 2014. So the picture dates back of 2014. So at least almost 10 years have been um, already, uh, some uh, programs have been doing this. This at the subway, again, in Paris, and this is at, our super, at a supermarket back again in Paris. So people have been doing this already for a while and data has been slowly trickling in about the benefits of this. Um, this is the ambulance that they use over there, looks just like a regular ambulance. And the reason that I'm bringing that is because we're not in Paris, we're in America. In America, we do things the American way. So this is a ECMO, uh, mobile ECMO CPR unit from the University of Minnesota. You can see a little bit bigger than that uh, tiny puny ambulance. Uh, <laughs> so, so they are probably the pioneers here in the US of, of, of ECMO CPR, both of out of hospital and in hospital cardiac arrest. And their model unit is just incredible. They have basically capabilities of not only cannulating and transport, but doing fluoro imaging and, and, and doing CPR while on transport. It's pretty, pretty impressive. That brings us to of where we are today to close our little story here. So this is the ELSO, which is a consortium which gathers data from all around the world, basically on ECMO. Um, this general case of ECMO, we're not talking of ECMO CPR alone, and I'll show you that in a second, but just year to day, there's been at least 8,000 cases reported to them for ECMO. And eCPR, just in adults, at least 715 cases. So it's being used, it's being used at 715 cases that have been reported, who knows how, how many more. So it's being used and it's being used more and more. And a little caveat here, which is very interesting, this is just survival to DC. We're not talking about um, serial uh, performance uh, categories, which we'll talk in a second, but 30% of these patients have been reported to survive to discharge or transfer, which is significantly big, higher than historical cohorts. And this includes both in hospital and out of hospital cardiac arrest. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about what ECMO is. I assume that at least I know the fellows have been uh, beaten to death with ECMO this year. Um, so, so I'll be a little bit uh, short on it, but in the most basic sense, what it is is a circuit that will allow the extraction of deoxygenated blood through a venous port that will be pumped through a membrane, uh, which, has, which allows the exchange of oxygen and CO2, which can be regulated how much oxygen, how much CO2 you want to exchange, and that will go back through an arterial port, which can be in an artery or a vein. Many, many different type, types of ECMO, but in this case, because we're talking of ECMO CPR, I want to concentrate in VA ECMO and especially VA ECMO uh, with a femoral femoral axis. The reason I'm talking about this is because we're talking about patients who are in cardiac arrest. Those patients will need not only oxygenation support, but we also need circulatory support. That's why we do the VA. And the reason for it to be a femoral femoral axis is just allows, as we're gonna see in one picture uh, and a couple of slides here, it allows for better access for the um, team, easier access for the surgeon that it's doing it to do it from a single place while a patient is receiving chest compressions and the, and the body's moving. Before we go into everything, just to set expectations, we're talking about a pretty involved process here. Um, and this is what a picture of a patient in real life who's on ECMO looks like. You can see at least three different machines here. We have the ECMO machine, a, a dialysis machine, a uh, ventilator, you can see how many drips uh, dripping on the side. This is an extremely complex situation to care for these patients, not only for the nursing teams, but for the medical teams and for all the consultants. So just to put your minds in the mindset of who should we really be offering this to um, and who can benefit from the um, huge amount of resources that it takes 
um, to do this. Again, a little bit of, of, of cardiac arrest first, and then we'll talk about uh, what eCPR is, but incidence of cardiac arrest in the US is around 200,000 for in-hospital and 350,000 for out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. So we're talking about more than 500,000 cases in the US a year. Survival, as we said, historical cohorts, 20% for in-hospital, less than 10% for out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. So when we're reporting in general, overall, over the world, a 30% survival, it's a pretty significant thing. Um, but as a caveat, and, and we'll touch base on this also a little bit further, but survival may not be the best outcome that we're looking here for, and probably survival with good neurological outcome is what we should be really talking about. So what eCPR is, is the use of VA ECMO, again, which is explain what that was, uh, before or after obtaining ROSC, uh, with the goal of improving outcomes, and to deliver oxygen, oxygenated blood to vital, vital organs like the brain and the heart. ECPR can be applied in three different settings. So it could be out of hospital cardiac arrest, where the patient receives regular CPR in the field, gets transported to the hospital, and in the hospital they receive, they, they're cannulated. It could be out of hospital cardiac arrest, who receives cannulation in the field and it's transported, connected to the ECMO machine to the hospital, or it could be in hospital cardiac arrest that it's cannulated in the hospital. Um, if you can think about this, it needs to be done much more complex than any other type of ECMO. This needs to be done in seconds, in minutes, um, usually with patients who we don't know the candidacy before we're already doing the procedure. Um, and it's very technically challenging as they need to be cannulated while chest compressions are going. And for that and other reasons that we touch, we'll touch upon, we usually want to do this with mechanical uh, CPR, as you can see here with a Lucas device or similar to a Lucas device. Um, and we talked about FEMFEM bypass. So what's the evidence? So again, we just said that there's three different settings, and we need to keep this in mind when we're talking about the evidence, as the evidence will vary and the results will vary depending on what we're looking at. Is it uh, out of hospital with pre-hospital CPR, with in-hospital CPR, or with or an in-hospital cardiac arrest? As all, this is an extremely difficult thing to study. And you can imagine how this, not only is it a very emergent procedure that needs to be decided in seconds, it's nearly impossible. It's a Herculean task to be able to, to account for, for uh, co-founders. Uh, etiology of arrest is usually unknown at the time of the arrest. Um, Post-arrest care needs to be protocolized uh, for all patients. And it usually very varies a lot between centers. We're talking about TTM, we're talking about goals of oxygen, CO2, pressure goals, et cetera. There's a very limited number of eCPR capable centers in the US and in the world. So that also limits the, our ability to gather patients to study. And there's a huge rate of crossover as we're gonna see in one of our studies here. Uh, since it's a life saving procedure, um, physicians feel compelled to transition these patients from one team to one group to the other more than uh, somewhat frequently. So now we're going to talk about the evidence. We're going to start talking first about out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, and then we'll transition to in-hospital cardiac arrest. Um, this is the first study that I'm going to talk about. It's, it's, and not because it's the first one, but because it's, a, it's the largest one that we have, and it's a registered study. It's called the Extracorporeal Cardiopulmonary Resuscitation in Out-of-Hospital Cardiac Arrest. Um, and it's the largest study that we have. Again, 13,000 patients in general, were, and 525 of whom received the CPR. Uh, this was done, since it's a registratory study, sorry, it's very um, not extremely well controlled and had patients that received both out-of-hospital cardiac arrest with pre-hospital CPR and in-hospital CPR and doesn't necessarily account for that. What they found is that the rate of survival, as you can see here in the graph, is basically the same uh, with no statistical difference. And there's a lot of controversy with this study because, again, there was no good control group the eCPR was a discretion of the physician who received it, who didn't receive it. There was no control for timing and many patients, and we'll, we'll uh, learn in a minute that time is brain, basically, and time is life uh, for these patients. And many of these patients had more than 90 minutes of CPR before uh, being uh, able to be hooked up to the ECMO. Um, and the post-arrest care was not protocolized. So take these results with a huge grain of salt, but what I think they tell us is that if we're going to see a benefit for patients of eCPR, it's going to be when we select these patients correctly and when we figure out who really needs a benefit and when we have good protocols for the management of these patients, not only patient selection, but also protocol for the management. So now we're going to talk actually a little bit more of uh, in, in, a, in, in a chronological order, but this is the first actual prospective study um, on ECMO CPR. It's called the SAFEJ trial. 
extracorporeal cardiopulmonary resuscitation versus conventional cardiopulmonary resuscitation in adults with autophosphate cardiac arrest. It's a prospective observational study. Uh, they uh, had patients that had out of hospital cardiac arrest with in hospital CPR. Again, regular CPR or conventional CPR in the field transported to the hospital, cannulated in the hospital. Uh, the outcomes that we're looking for was rate of favorable uh, cerebral performance score, the category score at one and six months. And you can see they had 454 patients, two of 160 of which received ECMO. Uh, being an observational study, it's impossible to control again for all the confounders. And here's the distribution of their patients, fairly similar, again, benefiting of the, of the fact that they were a large study, uh, but with some caveats and important differences. A little bit of difference in arrhythmias. And this is important because we know that um, patients with a uh, uh, shockable rhythm tend to have a better outcome than patients with non shockable rhythm, slightly bigger uh, portion in the eCPR group, and a significantly larger proportion of patients with an unknown cause of arrest in the uh, non-ECPR group, in the conventional CPR group. This is interesting because uh, you, I think you can um, analyze this in a couple of different ways. You can either say, oh, this means that there were many more patients that we didn't know who they were or, or what was going on in the, the non-ECMO CPR group, and that um, makes our data less or more murky. Or <laughs> I think that really the reason that you have this is because probably these patients didn't survive enough to figure out what, what the cause of the CPR is different to the ECMO group, which have a longer survival and allows the team to actually um, figure this out. More important differences that I really want to hone on is that the ECMO group received much more therapeutic hypothermia, much many more intraortic balloon pumps, much more coronary angiographies, and basically the same rate of PCIs. Um, what they found here was that the cerebral performance category scores were significantly better both at one and six months for the ECMO CPR group. So 12 uh, versus 1.5%, 11 versus 2.6%, so significantly different. Uh, and what the authors concluded was that for out of hospital cardiac arrest patients with BFIP or BTAG arrest on the initial EKG treatment bundle of eCPR, therapeutic hypothermia, and intral aortic balloon pumps improve neurological outcomes at one and six months. Hot on the heels of this was the CHEER trial called the refractory cardiac arrest uh, treated with mechanical CPR, hypothermia, ECMO, and early reperfusion. This was, again, perspective and observational, single center uh, with much smaller numbers, as we're going to see. And what they were analyzing was the impact of mechanical CPR, again, using a Lucas device, similar as we do here, hypothermia, and how they defined hypothermia was, or how they did the hypothermia, rapid infusion of cold saline, iced saline at 33 degrees for 24 hours. Very different of what uh, we currently do and ECMO for both in-hospital and out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. And every patient in this study had more than 15 minutes of arrest before they were um, enrolled in the study or before they received the ECMO CPR. They had 26 patients, 11 on the out-of-hospital, 15 in the in-hospital, and this is the distribution. But basically what they found is that 45% survival for out-of-hospital cardiac arrest and 60 for in-hospital cardiac arrest with good neurological outcomes. Tiny study, but extremely exciting data. Again, if we compare it with um, with historical cohorts. They concluded also that a protocol including eCPR instituted by a critical care team in refractory cardiac arrest, which includes mechanical CPR, peri-arrest uh, um, uh, hypothermia, and ECMO is feasible and associated with uh, high rate of survival. This followed then by the first actual uh, uh, RCT, which was done in 2020 here in the US, University of Minnesota, <laughs> uh, and which is called the ARREST trial. So it uh, was a single center, open label, adaptive safety and efficacy trial uh, with patients with out of hospital arrest and no uh, ROS after three shocks. So it had to be shocked three times. They all received a Lucas device uh, or, or, or a mechanical CPR and the transfer time was less than 30 minutes. So they had to be transferred to the hospital very quickly. Again, this out of hospital cardiac arrest with in hospital CPR, eCPR, sorry. Um, the outcome they looked was uh, discharge, uh, survival at the time of discharge, and functional assessment and three to six months. This distribution of their patients, basically they had 30 patients enrolled, 15 to each team, and only 14 of the ECMO CPR were analyzed since one patient decided to withdraw from the study. Which I think that the fact that the patient decided to withdraw from the study oh, talks very good about the outcome that the patient might have had. So, <laughs> So uh, here are their, their, their uh, Koppelmeier curves and, and the, the modified ranking and serial performance scores. You can see a significant difference uh, um, between them. So survival, 
couple of days after the arrest, only one patient had survived in the conventional group. And six, seven, and then six patients had survived in the in the regular ECMO CPR group. So significantly different uh, survival rates. But the most important thing here, the most exciting thing, is the difference in the in the serial performance categories. You can see how a, a score less than two is good, and score less than three for modified ranking scale is good. It means that the patient is functionally capable, and all the patients that survive in the ECMO CPR group actually achieve this in their in their study. A couple of important caveats here, or, or things to mention. This trial was stopped early, um, and it was stopped early because it was found that the benefit was too great to not offer it to all patients. It had a very strong criteria for inclusion and exclusion of the patients. So everybody that was included there was very uh, well uh, designed and a very well, but very strong criteria, different to other studies that we mentioned before. And this was done in a very high volume center with a lot of experience. And I think that again, this highlights a little bit the importance of good volume and good protocols when we're doing this. This was followed shortly by the Prague, uh, Prague or out of hospital cardiac arrest trial, which was done in Prague, the Czech Republic. Um, and I'm sure that we're all thinking at this point, you know, this is it, like let's do CPR for everybody, but let's uh, uh, place our brakes here for a second and listen um, to this trial. So, so the question that they had was in patients with witness refractory out of hospital cardiac arrest, does the bundle of early intra arrest transport, extracorporeal cardiopulmonary resuscitation, and invasive assessment and treatment improve outcomes compared with standard resuscitation? And these are their findings. So they had 256 patients, large majority of them male, uh, 124 to the invasive strategy, the rest to the standard strategy. After 180 days, they found that 31% of the invasive strategy patients survived and 22% of the non invasive strategy patients survived with good neurological outcomes. And they concluded that um, there was no statistically significant or statistical uh, difference between these uh, patients. So their conclusion was among patients with refractory of hospital cardiac arrest, inter-arrest transport, eCPR, and invasive assessment and treatment did not improve survival with neurological favorable outcome at 180 days. And this is the reason that I, uh, I'm kind of a personal fan of, of pragmatic studies, because if you ask me to be in which group I want to be if I have a cardiac arrest and I want to have a 31 chance of survival or 22% chance of survival, I want the 31% chance of survival uh, with good neurological outcomes. And um, there's a couple of caveats here. It was also stopped early, um, this study. So underpowered in general, this, the, the, the authors admit this in their publication. It was underpowered uh, probably to detect a difference. And there was a very high or very significant crossover rate. So 11 patients from the standard group end up receiving ECMO CPR. Majority of them did well. And nine patients of the invasive strategy were not able to be cannulated and did poorly. So when you add these numbers uh, to this and you do a protocol analysis, the actual numbers look better than what they do in the intention to treat uh, study. And this actually study has been um, gathered for many experts as more evidence of benefit really than a benefit of non, uh, evidence of non-benefit. Another study that puts a caveat in all of what we're saying is the, the inception trial, very recent publication in the, in the New England, which is a multi-center. And I know I just mentioned pragmatic studies, but this was a pragmatic study and didn't give us the data that we wanted. Um, <laughs> uh, randomized RCT, eCPR versus CPR for out of hospital cardiac arrest with in-hospital CPR again. Every study that we've talked that has a strict criteria is out of hospital cardiac arrest, transport and cannulation in the hospital. Uh, and these patients had more than 15 minutes with ventricular arrhythmias. Here's this, the distribution of their, of their patients. Basically 134 patients were included in the study and 70 versus 63 were divided. And this is the findings that they had. So survival favorable outcomes at 30 days and six months is the first two lines that we have there. Um, and it was 20 versus 16% in both of them. And they, they also concluded that it was also not significant difference uh, for this. And <laughs> This I find very funny, but they do say that the rate of ad serious adverse events was higher in the ECMO CPR group. But I wonder what's a more serious than dying. Um, so, you know, I, I would take a couple more serious adverse events over, over not having them in, if, if, if I can survive. But this trial has uh, spoke a lot of clinical controversy uh, or a lot of controversy. And the reason for that is that different to the prior trials that we have talked about how the design and the structure has been, has been pretty tight, this was a cent at the centers that were included were centers that had minimal experience in ACPR. Most of their centers had a prior eCPR program. So the eCPR programs were established at the time of doing the, the study. 
prolonged low flow times. So some patients had more than 60 minutes uh, before they were hooked up to ECMO. Uh, withdrawal of life-sustaining measures was, was done fairly early. And there was no real control for the different centers for the post-arrest care. So again, I think that we're sensing kind of like a common thread here. Uh, and for me, the common thread is there's very likely a huge potential for benefit if we do this correctly. But indiscriminately, probably not the tool that we want to use. So as a kind of gathering all the information for out of hospital cardiac arrest, we think it's feasible uh, for uh, with uh, to do eCPR with in, uh, out of hospital cardiac arrest with inpatient uh, cannulation, and there's a signal definitely for improved survival for these patients. As a caveat, we mentioned the Prague CPR study, Prague out of hospital cardiac arrest study uh, that was negative, but very recently in May of this year, this uh, analysis was done gathering both the data from arrest and from Prague CPR. And they actually found that 32.4% uh, of the invasive uh, team and 19.7% in the non-invasive group uh, survived. And the conclusion of this study when accumulating for giving Prague a little bit more power is that uh, this is very beneficial also for at 30 and 180 days for survival with, again, favorable neurological outcomes, which is probably what we want, um, especially if we can consider, and we'll touch base this in ethics, but when we talk about ethics, but especially when we can consider the larger amount of patients who will survive, this will inevitably bring, bring also more patients that will survive with no good neurological outcomes that we'll have to deal with as a system. So, um, for pre-hospital CPR, so we mentioned all these studies come from out-of-hospital CPR, out-of-hospital cardiac arrest that received in-hospital CPR. But there's also this group of patients who have the, the, the possibility of receive cannulation on the field. And this has the potential to be a significant improvement for them. Data for this is still very mixed uh, and, and, and we don't really know. And it's extremely logistically difficult. Imagine how difficult it is to actually bring the whole team to cannulate a patient on the field. So. Uh, being done in some places, um, recently some centers here in the US, but just keep it in mind, hopefully in the future we'll ha have more data about this, but for now, we don't have much to talk about it. Now let's change the gears for patients with in-hospital cardiac arrest. Um, data for in-hospital cardiac arrest is actually a little bit more uh, uniform, although not as strong uh, as we're gonna see just because we don't have RCTs performing this. So 2008, this is the first study by Chen, it was a propensity score match analysis of 46 match pairs in 135 patients who were receiving CPR and were cannulated after 10 minutes of CPR, of, of not uh, achieving ROSC. So here's their uh, survival curve. There's a 34% overall survival to discharge in the um, in-hospital CPR, eCPR team. They looked at zero performance scores too. And you can see the huge difference here at the discharge 23 versus 10.6% with a CPC score one or two. And at six months, it's 15 versus 8.9%, sorry. So almost doubling the outcomes of, of uh, good scores and, and good um, performance. Um, very important is that they were the first ones to describe this phenomenon that probability of survival decreases very rapidly with time to initiation of ECMO. With patients uh, that had it initiated in less than 30 minutes, having a 50% rate of survival overall, and patients having it more than 60 minutes or more than 90 minutes, having a less than 10% survival rate. So again, time is brain, time is heart, time is important for everything. Um, and this brings us again to this extremely important uh, uh, point is that time matters and matters a lot. And this is uh, just, Speaking on the same uh, thing that we just discussed, but also it has been studied for out of hospital cardiac arrest in VTAC and VFib. Beyond 30 minutes, each additional 10 minutes decreases survival by 25%. So, extremely important. And this is something that needs to be considered when designing a program, uh, which we will talk about our program and our design in a minute. Um, so, from that study came this uh, study by Shin, which they studied for actually survival for two years with good performance. Uh, a performance score for two years, and they found a higher two-year adjusted survival. Uh, also retrospective evaluation of 406 adults who underwent CPR for more than 10 minutes. This is their distribution. Basically, 120 patients were matched one-to-one, -one. Uh, and what they were looking for was for survival, and these are the curves. So survival with minimal neurological impairment, again, very different, 35 versus less than 20% um, for the groups versus both in unmatched and matched groups. They also distributed by quartiles of time. Their time uh, quartiles were different. They were 10 to 20 minutes, 
20 to 35, 35 to 53, and more than 54 minutes to uh, cannulation. And you can see how impressively there's a drop on survival the longer that we wait. Again, extremely important to figure out how we can really do this in a very stressful situation with patients who we don't know who's going to benefit from it. We have to cannulate extremely quickly. And um, this last curve here is a, a CPR duration and probability of two-year survival with a uh, minimum neurological outcome. And you can see how once CPR goes more than 60 or 80 minutes, uh, basically the probability of not only surviving, but surviving with good neurological outcomes is basically nil. Two meta-analyses have been done with this data and 10 other or, or some other small studies. This was the first one published in 2016, um, in which they found a, this is the, the, the articles that they use, sorry, uh, 10 articles included for cardiac arrest. And what they found was an absolute risk difference of around 13% favoring eCPR. So cumulation, cum, cumulative study of all the studies for, for inpatient CPR shows benefit, uh, inpatient cardiac arrest, sorry. And this was a follow-up uh, um, meta-analysis also for, with the same vein, but done in 2020. So a little bit more data um, that they had. They included 19 studies um, for, their, for their trial. And basically what they looked was probability of surviving with a good serial performance category and probability of surviving too. And what they found is that actually, if you are going to survive, there's an 84% chance you will survive with a good serial performance category. This is extremely exciting. You know, it's 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 great uh, that we could move and advance the care for 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 cardiac arrest so much. And their probability of survival overall in this study, um, independently of of serial performance score, was around thirty percent for these patients. So, to summarize our care for uh, in hospital cardiac arrest, no completed prospective studies, so data is a little bit weaker. Um, eCPR is feasible in the patient population single based on, on, on the studies that we discussed, and there's a signal to improve outcome with several performance, uh, acceptable several performance category. And here we have the whole enchilada. There was a, a meta-analysis done recently ag aggregating data of absolutely every study, both for inpatient, in-hospital, out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. And basically what they found that survival with good neurological outcomes was around 21% with a mean time of ICU discharge of 12 days. Um, we expect that a selection criteria as we have just discussed becomes stringent and more and, and stronger these outcomes will improve. Uh, and again, the benefit of eCPR, we're going to see it very likely in high volume centers, centers that have good protocols, centers that are doing this uh, uh, probably the correct way, and uh, places where there's strict criteria, short time to cannulation, and specialized post eCPR care with structured target different management and immediate access to percutaneous coronary intervention if needed. Um, of course, this requires significant resources from hospitals, communities, and uh, physicians. I'm not going to dwell too much into complications, but but I just showed you a little while ago a picture of a patient receiving ECMO and how much involvement there was in a, in a room of a patient like this. And, and I just want to mention that this is not completely a benign thing. There's many complications associated with, with uh, receiving ECMO in general. And again, we just said that dying is probably the worst complication of them all, but um, there's significant complications that can uh, generate we have to think of these patients when they survive, what quality of life are they gonna have? And that's something that we need to consider when you see these patients. And you know, some of the most important uh, uh, things here are thrombosis with limb ischemia, not, not infrequent to happen in patients with on ECMO. Um, so you may survive, you may survive as an amputee, for example, things that can happen. Um, cerebral damage for rapid CO2 change and um, cardiac failure from LD over the stanchion when fighting was as the LD improves fighting against the ECMO pressure. So just things that need to be considered and, and need to be um, gathered and thought about when we're thinking about these patients. So I thought a lot about uh, what to write in this slide. Should I write better outcomes or worse outcomes? At the end of this, I just write the worst outcomes, but you can think it the other way around for the, the factors that will uh, improve outcomes. But the point of this is, although we don't have, we don't know the whole uh, picture yet, we've learned a lot about what factors are associated with better and worse outcomes. And a better understanding of this fact is essential to aid in patient selection and aid in really helping these patients. And so far what we gather is that the ideal patient for eCPR is somebody that's younger, that have a very short low flow time. And by low flow time, we mean time before they're being cannulated, time before we have that support to allow the brain and the, and the heart and other organs to receive what they need. Um, patients who have a no flow time, meaning from cardiac arrest to actually starting CPR less than 10 minutes. Again, brain is time or time is brain. 
patients that have a um, V-fib, V-tag, or at least a shockable or a rhythm, and patients that have been receiving high-quality CPR and have access to good target temperature management. So let's, that's the evidence. Let's uh, turn gears now and let's talk about the logistics of an eCPR program like the one that we have in Yale. We just saw the picture and we can just imagine how complex this is, how difficult it is to set up a program like this. So eCPR requires specialized center, large amount of resources, high cost to start and high cost to maintain a program. These are not cheap machines, not, uh, and, and adds a lot to the cost of these patients. May require changes in protocols for out of hospital and in hospital cardiac arrest and algorithms, not only for the center that's applying it, but for the whole community. Um, screening CPR patients and timing of cannulation right here can be challenging, but I, I think that can underscores really or undermines really what this is. And it's it is extremely challenging to cannulate somebody on time and to know who to cannulate. And we mentioned all these studies, but, but this is extremely important. The timing to initiate cannulation, this data from, cumulative data from all these high volume eCPR centers, um, their average for in-hospital CPR, in-hospital cardiac arrest to get cannulated is around 42 minutes plus minus 25. We just said that the difference between 30 minutes and 60 minutes is incredibly important and significant for these patients. So just imagine how variable this is even in high volume centers. And for out-of-hospital CPR, 87 plus minus 27. So really, we need to do better. We need to find ways that we can cannulate these patients uh, more rapidly and then connect them to the most more rapidly. So, and as we just mentioned, may increase the number of patients without meaningful chance of recovery or patients who may progress to brain death. And what are we going to do about this as a society? post ACPR care needs to be extremely well controlled. Patients need to have access to PCI. Uh, many of the studies that, that, that we mentioned um, have shown also that access to rapid uh, PCI improves outcomes for these patients, access to TTM and appropriate TTM. And the truth is that we don't know what appropriate TTM is, um, uh, but we know that it helps. We just don't know exactly how and, and, and how much. Targets of CO2 and oxygen management. Again, we don't know what the uh, appropriate CO2 and, or, and, and, and oxygen targets are for these patients. We know that too much CO2 is bad. When it's a too little CO2 is bad. Uh, we know that overcorrection too rapidly is bad. Um, but what's the real target is something that need, still needs to be studied. And of course, access to significant anticoagulation of these patients are going to need to be connected. But so what are we doing here? So. Yale is a very high volume center. We have around 500 in-hospital cardiac arrest and receive around 250 out-of-hospital cardiac arrest every year, so around 750. Previously, there was no process here to get patients hooked up to, to, to eCPR, but since February of this year, the pilot, a pilot program has started um, only at York Street campus for now, uh, 7A to 7P, uh, with a focus on in-hospital arrest patients we're going to see when we talk about exclusion criteria out of hospital, maybe, but in hospital cardiac arrest patients, 18 to 75 years of age, um, who experience cardiopulmonary arrest in the ED or inpatient units, um, being cared for the, by the adult team. Uh, and, and the initial estimates were that we were going to have around three or four patients per month that meet the criteria, and we'll touch base on that. I'm not going to go too deeply into this, but this is just a list of the different teams that are in the ECPR program. And you can imagine what a Herculean task is to get all of these people, all of the different teams to, to coordinate, to be able to mount a program. You're talking the heart vascular service line, CT surgeons, the Department of Medicine, both with cardiology and critical care, um, the rapid response team, perfusionist, anesthesia, the OR, all the critical care units, respiratory therapy, emergency medicine, pharmacies, ethics, everybody to be able to, to, to see these patients and select very quickly who we're going to handle and who, and who are, are we not. So pretty involved. Criteria for, for um, who receives it, I think this is important because we're all here going to get a uh, call for this. Um, age, so more than 18, less than 75 years of age, witness cardiac arrest, hopefully with initiation of CPR immediately, but, but definitely less than 10 minutes. Shockable initial rhythm or PEA, which is already pushing the envelope a little, but PEA arrest, so just somebody that has a rhythm. And tidal CO2 of more than 10, meaning that the patient is receiving good compressions, either through a Lucas device or through the compressions the team is doing, but compressions need to be good. If we know that they're not, we know that the outcomes are going to be worse. Patients that have alternating ROS can arrest, so they may ha not have more than 10 minutes of CPR, but if they are obtaining CPR, obtaining ROS, failing, obtaining ROS, failing, those patients also enter. 
a minimum arrest time of 10 minutes. And this has been standard between all the, all the studies that we've discussed with some 15 minutes, some 10 minutes. But in general, you want enough time to know that this patient is not going to return to spontaneous circulation on their own, but not enough time that the outcomes are going to be worse. So obviously, very short windows there. Um, signs of life during CPR. So somebody that's receiving CPR and appears that they are going to do better. Uh, any reversible causes of arrest. And anybody who achieves ROS but it requires very high doses of inotropes can be considered to be placed on ECMO at the time. Contraindications, some absolute ones out of the age range. And basically, the contrary of what we just discussed on witness arrest, um, initiation of chest compression more than 10 minutes, time to ECMO flow more than 60. So if the patient was accepted, they're trying to get the ECMO flow in, but it takes more than 60 minutes, that can be aborted. Asystole or a non chocable or not, not, no rhythm, and entitled CO2 less than 10 or poor uh, chest compressions. And evidence of any of these severe illnesses. And you, know, you can think about any reason that a patient would be reasonably expected to not survive. Contraindications, um, a relative story, we just mentioned out of hospital cardiac arrest. So, so eventually, hopefully, it can be included. But for now, uh, it's more of a thought. Um, high BMI, poor access to inhibition, ESRD, and inability to tolerate anticoagulation. The process, basically, what happens is CP uh, cardiac arrest is called. There's a pre-screening by the eCPR team. Uh, and within the first five minutes, they have to decide could this patient meet criteria. And basically, the only thing that they need to know is that they don't have any absolute exclusion, me meaning what's an old witness. Uh, the CO2 is not, the, the, the entitled CO2 is not less than 10. There's no significant intracranial bleed that would prevent them from getting any, any anticoagulation, no comorbid condition. If the patient meets that initial screening, the ECMO CPR is called, and all these teams go to bedside to decide if the patient is going to be cannulated. They bring a cannulation card, supplies, ECMO circuit, ultrasound, a Lucas device, which in our center, many are already, the Lucas is usually already there, but still, and the ECMO personnel to respond to code. They do a bedside huddle. And in all this very short amount of time, they decide is the patient screened out, the CPR is continued, and regular CPR is continued. But if the patient is screened in, the surgeon starts getting prepared, the patient is placed in the Lucas device. And while the, the surgeons are preparing, the eCPR team continues to confirm candidacy to make sure that this patient can achieve. And once they're cannulated, they will go to the, to the CPITU. We talked about cost. And, and just very brief to mention, there's no cost studies done in the US. So um, our healthcare system, as I'm sure everybody knows here, is very different than any other. So very di difficult to say what the cost benefit analysis here in the US is. Um, but I would say that it's almost impossible to really figure this out as those analyses are not considering also the potential for increased organ donation, increased uh, uh, patient survival, uh, economic improvements, and, and, and all these things that can come with it. So extremely difficult to analyze for this kind of patients, but hopefully more studies will come with that. So what have we done here so far? So since February, there's, there has been 330 in-hospital cardiac arrests. Uh, 16 eCPR team activations with seven patients declined and nine patients actually included. Five of those were unable to obtain ROSC either because it was difficulty or failed cannulation or poor flow despite uh, ECMO. But the, the four that were actually being able to place an ECMO, two went with ROSC but two survived. So very preliminary data, very, very early. Um, for the nine patients, there's, I guess, that, that were included, there's a 22% survival. But for the four patients that were actually can, uh, cannulated, there's a 50% survival. Um, our historical survival here is around 20%. This is just beginning. Hopefully in the future, we'll have much data and much better data for this, but it's very exciting and it's happening and hopefully it's gonna make a huge difference for our patients. Well, we don't know, I mentioned this already, but there's a lot of stuff still that we need to study um, to figure out for these patients. But the last thing that I wanna leave you guys with is a little bit of a discussion of a thought about the ethics of this. and and what happens with the patients who cannot go anywhere with ECMO? So, so what is ECMO? ECMO is always a bridge to something. So is it a bridge to lung transplant? Is it a bridge to a uh, bad device? Is it a bridge to recovery and removal of the circuit? Uh, but what's gonna happen to these patients who don't have a neurological recovery and who are connected to an ECMO machine and don't have prospects of improving? What about somebody that actually achieves some kind of neurological outcome, but has a lesion and is now dependent of surviving on, on, on an ECMO machine. These are not frequent, but can happen. Then what is ECMO actually? What is eCPR? Is it an extension of regular CPR? 
So by the time that we connect the patient, it is something we at any point just say, oh, that's it, we stop. When does it transition actually to be something chronic like CV, CVH, uh, CVH or, 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 or dialysis and just another supporting device? And when it transitions to be something chronic, can you still stop it unilaterally at some point? Um, what happens if the patients don't have families to help us with this, this kind of decisions? What is the DNR with somebody on, on somebody? With, what is the DNR ordering somebody who is already hooked up to a machine who is, that is capable of allowing perfusion without cardiac compressions? Should these patients have a DNE order or do not ECMO order on them? And more importantly, what are we going to do with the organ? So, so what happens with these patients with the amount or increased amount of organ donors? And should we offer them eCPR for patients who may not survive but have potential for donating organs and helping other people survive? Um, all of these are questions that I don't have answers for. And, and I don't expect anybody here to have them, but it's, it, it's interesting to think about um, as this is the future, it will be happening. And as a society, it's something that we need to be considering. And that's all that I have uh, for today. I'd be happy to, to ask any questions. And because I don't need any excuses to show my son, um, there he is. <laughs> Thank you. Are there any questions for the audience? Yeah, Isabel. Actually, I'm going to bring this to you. All right, Andres, thank you so much. That was very comprehensive and very helpful. Um, as someone who's been curious about what that background has been and what the outcomes look like and what so far the success has been um, or the work has been at Yale. Um, in terms of the time to cannulation being so important for the neurological recovery, what do you see as the future of cannulation? And is it going to stay in the hands of the CT surgeons? Or is there going to be a huge benefit to intensivist cannulation to really benefit the that time, you know, shorten that time um, to ECMO? That, that's a great question. And my short answer is. Uh, start training to learn how to cannulate. Uh, <laughs> but the long answer is a little bit more complex than that. And, and some centers are doing that. Some centers are trying to balance uh, the risk of more um, complications uh, when uh, teams that are less well-trained or that do this less frequently cannulate versus the improvement in time for cannulation. And there's been a couple of studies actually on this or a couple of, a little bit of data on this. And there doesn't seem to be a, a huge increase in complications. And I think there, the world will move to that to allow more teams to cannulate. In other countries, actually, uh, 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 critical care and ED teams to cannulate. Um, I think that it's moving towards that. And in the future, it will allow for shorter times, hopefully, between other things. I think that better and smaller cannulas at some point will hopefully help that um, and better technology to really achieve short cannulation. This is not a, you know, it sounds like easy. You just put a big tube in an artery and a vein, but it's not that simple. And so it's just a big tube. It's a patient bleeding, a patient receiving compressions. A uh, patient who usually doesn't necessarily have great vasculature um, with poor imaging. So, so I think that hopefully also a standardization of Lucas devices, which are regular compressions in a, in a, in a strict way different than you and I would do, uh, would also allow for for short times, hopefully. Thanks, Iris. I think you, in some ways, anticipated my question, but I was kind of bringing a little bit of skepticism to the idea that this is a generalizable intervention. From what I understand of these studies that you've reviewed beautifully, a lot of the cannulation was done by a few people who are just unbelievable at it and can do it very, very quickly. And since this is an intervention that needs to be delivered 24 hours a day, you know, anytime, maybe any place, as you're saying, um, it does seem like we're going to need some type of technology uh, breakthrough to make it easier to be able to kind of routinely cannulate, especially some of our larger patients or patients with uh, chronic vascular disease, et cetera. Um, so I guess the second part of my question was you highlighted really nicely how a lot of these interventions are multi-component interventions, um, uh, uh, transport, uh, 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 CPR during transport, the use of, of the Lucas um, to what degree can we take the lessons um, of uh, just an improved program, multi-component program to improve outcomes of cardiac arrest and potentially get some of the same benefits? Thanks. Yeah, um, to 
I, I I took both of them actually a little bit and and but initially with your first question, I don't think that this is a fully generalizable thing. I think that that at least for the foreseeable future will be uh, reserved to big centers with the with the the resources. I don't think that we're going to be seeing this in the community for a long long time. Hopefully, not too long, but but at least for some time. Um, I foresee a time where and and you can see this with auction delivery devices, actually with the first ECMO machines. And you know, I just showed a picture of the first bubble dispersion oxygenator, but but the first ECMO machine is was probably the size of this whole half size of the of the amphitheater, you know, and, and now we have things that are a little bit smaller than this table. And uh, hopefully in you know 10, 20 years we'll have things that are more akin to a phone or or, or you know a small box that, that will also allow for quicker transport, quicker management of these patients. Um, it's coming and, and there exists some newer ECMO technologies that are smaller and, and easier to manage, but still, of course, uh, uh, it's going to take some time. Um, I'm sorry, what was the, se the second part of the question? Yeah. 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 So it's again, it's an impossible task. It's so many things that you have to to uh, tease out for this patient. So so really to figure out, it's for the foreseeable future. Again, I think it's going to be a combo, and and it has to keep being studied as a whole until we know how to benefit these patients and until we know what good uh, outcomes we can obtain in what centers. And then probably we could start piecing out. But yeah, the transport is very important. So 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 that uh, Prague OHA uh, out of hospital cardiac arrest trial. Um, part of what they were trying to figure out is what happened if instead of we doing CPR on the field, trying to achieve some uh, stability and then transport patient, what if, if we transported them while we do the CPR to get them to the, to the hospital? And these are all important things that have to end up at some point in figuring out how we decrease the times. And probably pre-hospital ECMO cannulation is going to be the the result of that, but again, extremely hard to implement in real life. Pass the bike off, just to piggyback off what Andreas said, just, I think from our experience and other hospitals experiences, when they end up building these programs, what you end up seeing is just a lot of priority and education around just conventional CPR. Cause if you don't have good conventional CPR, you're not gonna have good outcomes with your eCPR either. Um, there's also been a lot of education and I think support for post-arrest care. So recently we've had post-arrest bundles. There's been a lot more education on uh, therapeutic hypothermia or temperature control that I think all of these things together are going to help with outcomes, not just for the eCPR group, but just in totality for all of our cardiac arrest patient population. And, and hopefully we continue to see that that progress happening. Um, the pre-hospital eCPR group is really interesting. LA County um, just you know released their data. They're really focusing on a hub and spoke model where they're looking at patients who are resting in the field and moving very quickly to a hospital that's capable of eCPR rather than uh, obtaining the resources to cannulate in the field themselves. I think it really depends on location and how far you are from where you're resting to the hospital on if pre-hospital uh, eCPR is going to be a benefit or not. So that stay in play versus scoop and go to the hospital is just really difficult to discern. Is going to be really dependent on the community and the reason that patients are arresting. So LA County, large amount of volume from airplanes. They see a lot of PE as their arrest, which is going to do really well on eCPR. Someone that has more opioid use or drug use might not have the same outcomes. I'm just gonna pass. Um, thank you, Andres, for a really good comprehensive discussion. So, so I'm having trouble wrapping my head around the decision making for appropriateness of the use of eCPR, given the sheer number of people involved, variables to consider, and how time dependent it all is, and and. I just wonder how do you get to reliable decision making under those circumstances? And is there anything that we could do to try to um, improve reliability? So for example, um, you could easily imagine in hospital that there might be some way to designate not just full code, but full code plus CCPR should this happen, or to use the power of technology with artificial intelligence and say, okay, this is the person, if this person arrests, you're getting a signal that this is an appropriate candidate, so don't dwell over their performance status and you know whether the malignancy is real or not and all those sorts of things that I think would become unmanageable. 
Absolutely. And, and, and that's uh, part of the last question that I was asking. Uh, should we have do not ECPR orders a standard in the, in, in the hospital? Again, I, this is too new, um, at least for our center and, and, and for many centers in the U.S., um, to really have standardized. But, but I think so. I think that that's extremely important because it's going to allow, um, especially that when the calls are done, are done appropriately for patients that actually are going to benefit from that. The use of artificial intelligence, I'm sure it's coming. I didn't see file when I was looking at it, any studies on it. Um, I don't know if anybody in the room or, or, or Akil knows of anything. I don't think that it exists, but it's an amazing idea. Um, because yeah, these patients, I think that not only for getting the appropriate patients, but also to avoid uh, exhaustion for the te from the teams when they're gonna be called more and more and more to evaluate these patients. Um, we're all humans and we all, if you're called 20 times and only one patient classifies, the 21st time you're called, your bias is already to say no. Uh, so if we can avoid that and just do three calls and maybe only one classifies at the end, but um, I think that we can benefit also the, 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 the treaters or the people that are our physicians that are getting there. Yeah. Yeah, Chris, I think we have uh time just for one last question here. This is from the, the chat. Ian asked, um, given the importance of high quality compressions and minimizing low flow time, should we try to get a Lucas in place ASAP? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So short, short answer. <laughs> yes. I think logistically, depending on where you are, it can be difficult, right? <laughs> so at our institution, we have one Lucas device on this campus. So uh, understanding how difficult it can be to you know, deploy that Lucas, have it set up and working can take time, but it is something that um, I think the rapid response and uh, co-teams are, are working really hard on. We're joined by Laura and Melissa, who've been doing a lot of education on that as well. All right, and I think that's all. Thanks again for the presentation. That was a great kickoff to uh, the Pulmonary Grand Rounds. Thank you, Laura.